Today we're going to talk about complex power. Uh, complex power is a quantity used by power engineers to succinctly characterize the power absorbed by a given load in a sinusoidal steady state circuit. It's a very powerful and useful quantity in steady state sinusoidal power analysis because it contains all of the information pertaining to the power absorbed by a given load. Uh, so let's say that we have a generic load impedance Z. Since we're dealing with an impedance, this means that we are analyzing this in the frequency domain. So I'm going to define a phasor voltage V that occurs over our impedance <coughs> and a phasor current I that flows through our impedance. And these again are just representing um, the frequency domain representation of the time domain sinusoidal voltage and current signals respectively that are occurring over our network of interest. <coughs> so in the frequency domain, our voltage phasor V is characterized by two quantities, its magnitude Vm and its phase angle theta V and our current phasor is characterized by its magnitude, I m, and its phase angle, theta i. Uh, typically speaking, when we're dealing with complex power, we want to be working in what's called the RMS phasor domain. Um, this is the domain where we utilize effective values. So, in the RMS phasor domain, we'll transform our frequency domain signals to their RMS phasor counterparts. And I'm going to denote an RMS phasor by a tilde over it, as opposed to the bar I used for the regular phasor domain. So, since we're dealing with a sinusoidal signal, <coughs> excuse me, and we know that the effective value of a sinusoid is simply the magnitude of the sinusoidal signal divided by a square root of two, we can convert our RMS, or excuse me, our frequency domain phasors into RMS phasors by simply dividing our phasor by the square root of two. So this is going to give us VRMS, the magnitude of our effective value. with a phase angle of theta v, and similarly, our RMS current phasor will be phasor current i divided by the square root of two, which will be i RMS, the effective value of our current waveform, with a phase angle of theta i. All right, um, now we can define complex power. So complex power is going to be defined as S is one half the phasor voltage times the complex conjugate of the phasor current, or using our RMS phasors, which is going to let us get rid of this factor of one half, we would have RMS phasor voltage multiplied by the complex conjugate of the RMS phasor current. So this is our mathematical definition for complex power. Now, this is simply the product of an RMS voltage and an RMS current. Um, so we're going to have volts times amps. So you may expect that the units of this should be watts. Um, but power engineers have de decided that they are going to classify complex power as being measured in volt amperes. So the units of complex power are the volt ampere. Fundamentally, a volt ampere is a watt because it's one volt times one amp. Um, but it would be too confusing to have different power quantities have the same units. So we use the unit of volt ampere to differentiate 
complex power from average power, which is what we've traditionally been dealing with in all of our previous power analysis problems. So if we substitute in these RMS phasor domain relationships into our equation for complex power, what we will find is that we can express the complex power S as VRMS IRMS cosine theta V minus theta I plus J VRMS IRMS sine theta V minus theta I. So this is a rectangular form representation of this complex multiplication. And in polar form, this will become VRMS IRMS with an angle of theta V minus theta I. And this is where we're going to revisit that statement I said at the very beginning of the class, that the complex power contains all of the information pertaining to the power absorbed by a given load. Uh, so the first portion that we're going to look at is the real part of S. So the real part of our complex power S is VRMS IRMS cosine theta V minus theta I. We are going to call this quantity the average power, um, which I'll write as capital P. In some textbooks, you may see it also with a subscript AVG for average. Uh, now, you may be thinking to yourself, Dr. Hartman, we've already defined complex power. We did that a couple of lecture go lectures ago for our instantaneous power circuits. Well, if we look at this expression, VRMS, IRMS, cosine theta V minus theta I, since we're dealing with a sinusoidal voltage, the RMS or effective value of the voltage is simply the magnitude of our voltage waveform divided by the square root of two. Similarly, IRMS is the effective value of our sinusoidal current, which is simply the magnitude of our current waveform divided by the square root of 2. And then we'll have this cosine theta V minus theta I. And if we multiply those two denominators together, we get 1 half VM IM cosine theta V minus theta I, which is the exact expression we got when we were looking at the average value of an instantaneous power. Um, so this P average is representing the exact same average power that we talked about before. We're just expressing it in a slightly different way using our effective values for our voltage and current across our load. Um, average power, and average power, as I stated previously, is measured in watts. Uh, next, let's look at the imaginary portion of our complex power, S. So the imaginary portion is everything that's multiplied by J. So that's going to give us VRMS, IRMS, sine theta V minus theta I. And we are going to call this portion Q, where Q is the symbol for what's called the reactive power. And reactive power has units of volt amperes reactive, or VARs. So again, fundamentally, a VAR is the same thing as a watt, 
but when we want to differentiate reactive power from average power, we use the unit of var. Reactive power, um, let's see, reactive power represents the portion of the complex power that continuously flows back and forth between the source and the load in a sinusoidal steady state system due to the presence of capacitors and inductors. Uh, so you may recall from our instantaneous power lecture that whenever we had a capacitor or inductor, a purely reactive element, the power, instantaneous power of our reactive elements, let's call this Px of t, looks something like this. So it was a sinusoidal power, uh, instantaneous power function where exactly half of the time the element was absorbing power and exactly half of the time the element was supplying power on a per cycle basis. The reactive power simply quantifies this back and forth trading of, of instantaneous power um, as a portion of the complex power. Now a question that I'm often asked in circuits one and circuits two is, if the reactive power simply represents power being transmitted and returned, transmitted and returned over and over and over again, uh, what's the point of it? What use does it have? Well, um, reactive power is actually used in a lot of applications. The two largest ones would be in electricity distribution and uh, the operation of electrical machines. So in an electricity distribution system, um, we take it for granted that the voltage present at our outlets is constant, when that's not remotely true. Uh, constant meaning it has a specific RMS value. Um, so if we were operating in a system where uh, the loads on the utility grid changed, let's say that on a typical day the average power consumption is some particular value, and then the utility is trying to get ready for say the Super Bowl or the final of the World Cup, where it's expected that more people will be at home uh, watching the game, so utilizing more appli home appliances like televisions, um, air conditioning units, um, blenders for making margaritas and things like that. Uh, so the consumer demand is going to be larger. Instead of permanently implementing infrastructure to cover this, instead what they will do is they will inject VARs into the system that will help to maintain or stabilize uh, the voltage levels. If they don't do this, that increase in load would cause more current to be flowing through the electricity grid. And when there's more current flowing through the grid, there are more resistive losses uh, that occur in the wires. And so these resistive losses are actually going to make the voltage that you would see at your outlet and receptacles and things like that be lower. Well, if those voltages get too low, they can, uh, that would prevent the correct operation of the appliances that you had connected to it. Uh, and if it happens on a large scale, that's what's called a blackout. So in order to avoid blackouts uh, in large areas, the utility or the electric company will actually inject VARs for voltage regulation purposes. Um, for electric machinery, what the reactive power does is it helps to maintain the magnetic flux that is required for rotation to occur uh, in rotating electric machines like an induction motor. Um, so without the reactive power portion um, our induction motors would not actually be able to turn, um, which would render them completely useless. So reactive power, even though it's just effectively temporary energy storage, is actually extraordinarily useful um, in several applications. All right. Um, so we've covered the real part of the rectangular form and the imaginary part of the rectangular form. Let's move on to the magnitude of the polar form. So the magnitude of the polar form VRMS multiplied by IRMS we are going to call this S 
where S is the apparent power. Notice that this S um, doesn't have a bar over it, so it's representing the magnitude of our complex power. So this is apparent power. It is measured in volt amperes, just like complex power, because we're only talking about the magnitude of it. And the apparent power is its kind of an abstract concept, but even more so than these other things. Uh, and by, by that I mean the apparent power is kind of a worst case scenario. It's the maximum amount of power that a load could draw if the voltage and the current, uh, the phases didn't matter, okay? So think of the apparent power as the power that the electricity company creates or, or generates um, either by burning coal um, to heat up boilers, which then feeds steam into a turbine, which generates electricity, um, or you know, by putting a hydroelectric dam in place and allowing uh, the water to flow through at a rate that it spins the turbine, et cetera. And the average power or the real part of the complex power is what we as electrical consumers actually pay for. So this is what the utility generates. This is what we pay for. And this is uh, the imaginary portion, the reactive power, is what's left over, the difference between those two. Um, you may see apparent power, uh, so things measured in volt amperes, specifically when you're shopping for um, say an item like an uninterruptible power supply. Uh, let's say you need to make sure that your computer can stay on for uh, 20 minutes in the event of a power outage or something like that. You might see that your UPS is rated for uh, 2 kVA uh, with 1800 watts. So that would mean that it could supply 2 kVA and a maximum of that apparent power could be 1800 watts of real or average power to supply your computer and uh, the remaining portion of the power would be for potentially uh, inductive loads like fans and things like that. Um, all right, the last portion here is the argument or the angle of our complex power S. And this is equal to theta V minus theta I. And we're going to call that theta s, which is our power factor angle. And it can be measured in either radians or degrees. It's an angle. Um, so it's not particularly important which one we use. Um, and when we come back, we're actually going to delve a bit deeper into the concept of power factor which is a very important topic in power engineering. The power factor at which an electrical element or network operates at is a measure of the efficiency of power transmission to or from that network. Um, so mathematically, we're going to define power factor in two ways. Um, they are identical, but they're representing the quantity in two different forms. Uh, so the first definition for power factor is a ratio. So a power factor is defined as the ratio of the average power divided by the apparent power. So if our power factor was one, that would mean that the average power and the apparent power were equal and we were operating at 100% efficiency. If our power factor was zero, that means that our average power is zero and our, our apparent power is whatever it happens to be and we are operating at zero percent efficiency. And efficiency here means effectively what portion of the power that we are creating, S, is capable of doing work. That's it, right? Um, our alternative definition is that the power factor is the cosine of theta V minus theta I, where theta V is the angle, uh, phase angle of the voltage over our load and theta I is the phase angle of the current through our load. And this then becomes cosine of theta S, where theta S represents our power factor angle. 
Um, all right, so. We can see that since the power factor is based on a cosine function, um, it's going to fall somewhere between positive one and negative one, where again, positive one means that we are operating at 100% efficiency. Uh, actually, we're absorbing power at 100% efficiency. And negative one means that we're supplying power at 100% efficiency. Anything less than that means that we have an inefficient system. And the closer we are to zero um, means the closer we are to operating at 0% efficiency. So, if our power factor is too low, then that means that whatever our source is, is being required to generate more than the minimum volt amperes necessary to supply the required average power needs of the load. Um, so if we are a consumer and we're operating at say an 80% power factor, that means roughly 20% of the power that's being generated um, by our electric utility is being wasted because it's in the form of a reactive power that's being generated by them, sent to us, and then we send it right back over and over and over again. Um, so this is where that inefficiency comes in. So what are the consequences of having an inefficient system like that? Well, the utility still had to create that power or generate that power, right? They had to buy that coal and burn it um, or put it, the infrastructure in to, to turn those turbines using um, some form of, of water energy. Um, but we are only going to be paying for the average or real portion of that total apparent power um, that's generated. So it's costing the electric utility money. Another consequence is that if the apparent power is high for a fixed voltage, that means that there's more current flowing in the system. More current flowing in a system means that you would have to utilize larger, like physically larger cables in order to carry that current safely um, because if you pass too much current through a small cable, it can heat up significantly and cause the insulation to melt, which could cause uh, shorts and things like that and can be extraordinarily dangerous. So it's a, not only is it a fire hazard, it's an electric shock hazard um, and, and lots of other things. So you'd have to upsize your conductors, which is also going to cost money. The more copper you use in your wires, the more expensive the wires are. So operating a system with a power factor that is less than one causes the utility to have to shell out more money to support that. Um, so if your power factor falls below a certain threshold, typically on the order of 95% to 97.5%, so if it falls below that, um, you're going to receive a fine, okay? And so that fine is to offset um, the cost of the utility in supplying that non-efficient power to you. Um, all right, so power factor has some particular magnitude, but it also has a second quantity. So like with a current, uh, if, if you told me that there was three amps of current flowing, but you didn't tell me the direction, you haven't given me the full picture of how the current is behaving. Well, power factor, it doesn't have a direction per se, but it does indicate a leading or lagging um, situation. So power factor um, can be leading which means the current leads the voltage and this occurs whenever negative 180 degrees is less than theta s, our power factor angle is less than zero degrees. So if our power factor angle is a negative, we consider the power factor to be leading because the current leads the voltage. And it can be lagging 
for the opposite case. So the current lags the voltage which occurs when our power factor angle is positive. Now typically speaking we're actually only going to be looking at situations um, where it's between positive 90 and negative 90 degrees. Um, so anything greater than positive 90 actually means that we have negative resistance and anything greater or excuse me more negative than negative 90 also indicates that there's negative resistance um, in the system. Um, so that's not something that we are going to see a whole heck of a lot in circuits one um, or circuits two really for that matter. Uh, I just wanted to mention it that these are the constraints on uh, our power factor being considered leading or lagging. All right, uh, the next topic that we're going to introduce is the power triangle. To help facilitate an easier understanding of the power relationships for a given load, power engineers have developed a graphical tool which illustrates these relationships known as the power triangle. Um, so let's say that we're interested in a particular load and I'm going to express this load in rectangular form, R plus Jx, so resistance is the real part and the reactance is the imaginary part. And let's work right now under the assumption that R and X are both positive quantities, okay? So if R and X are positive quantities, then we can express the complex power on a complex plane. Um, so where the horizontal axis is our real axis and the vertical axis is our imaginary axis. So for positive values of R and X, our complex power will lie in quadrant one, like so. Um, so from this simple picture, this vector on a plane, we can actually observe that uh, our apparent power is by definition the magnitude of our complex power. And the angle formed between our complex power and the positive real axis is our power factor angle theta s. The projection of our complex power onto the real axis is our average power P and the projection of our complex power onto the imaginary axis is our reactive power Q. Uh, and so now we have a relationship between all of these quantities succinctly summed up in a simple, a simple graphical relationship. And what's interesting about this is that we only need to know two quantities in order to figure out any of the remaining quantities just by using simple trig identities. So we, if we knew the power, uh, the average power and the power factor angle or even just the power factor, we could find the apparent power, the complex power and the reactive power only knowing those pieces of information. So any two pieces of information can be used to give us everything else just by using this simple triangle. Um, let's see. Additionally, we can determine further information about the behavior of the load by looking specifically at the value of the power factor angle. Um, so, let's start with the extreme cases. So if theta s is equal to 90 degrees, oh, and sorry, one thing that I should have uh, made better mention of, um, theta s by definition is theta v minus theta i. Well, if we looked at an impedance, impedance is defined as the ratio of the phasor voltage um, 
I'm going to use an RMS phaser here just for argument's sake, divided by um, the RMS current. This is going to be quantified as VRMS divided by IRMS. So this is going to be the magnitude of the impedance, and the angle of the impedance is going to be theta V minus theta I. So this is Z angle theta Z. So our power factor angle is the exact same thing as the angle of our impedance. That's what's going to allow us to determine um, the behavior of the load based simply on the power factor angle. So if theta S is equal to 90 degrees, that means that our power factor by definition will be zero, 0.0, 0, .0 right? Because cosine of 90 degrees is zero. And this also tells us that our load is purely inductive. Meaning that the resistance is zero and the reactance is positive. If zero is less than theta s is less than 90 degrees, then our power factor is lagging. And the load is inductive. And by that I mean it has some positive resistance and some positive reactance. If theta s is equal to zero degrees, our power factor is one, and the load is purely resistive. So R is positive, the reactance is zero. If negative 90 degrees is less than our power factor angle is less than zero degrees, our power factor is leading and the load is capacitive. So that means R is greater than zero, X is less than zero, and our final case is when theta S is equal to minus 90 degrees. Again, we would see that our power factor is zero um, and our load is purely capacitive. So that means R is zero and the reactance is negative. Um, so the, pi, excuse me, the power triangle is actually a very, very pow powerful tool um, because at a glance, we can determine so many different things about how our load um, is behaving. So we can tell if, uh, if our power factor is in quadrant one, that means that we know that the load is inductive, uh, the power factor is leading, and with simple trig relationships, we could figure out what um, Q, S, P, uh, what Q, S, or P is. Um, similarly, similarly, if we saw that um, our complex power fell in quadrant four, we would know that our load is capacitive, and we could again calculate all those quantities. So it's such uh, a useful and wonderful tool to use. Um, all of these relationships you will actually have to remember. Um, but as far as the relationships between S, P, Q, and S bar or the complex power are concerned, if you can draw this picture, 
and use your calculator correctly, you should be able to figure out all of these things. Uh, and what I mean by that is that modern calculators that are capable of performing complex math can typically give you an answer in either polar form or rectangular form. So if you're able to perform this simple operation, multiplying an RMS phasor voltage times the complex conjugate of an RMS phasor current, if you choose to express your answer in polar form, then you know what the apparent power is and what the power factor angle is right off the bat. If you choose to express your answer in rectangular form, then you are going to get the average power and the reactive power, all buried inside that complex power. So that's why this is such a fundamentally useful tool for power engineers. And you don't have to memorize 15 equations if you can understand the relationships that are embedded within the power triangle. All right, um, our next topic is going to be uh, some alternative complex power equations um, when we know more information about our impedance. Um, so if we have a particular impedance that is uh, well characterized, meaning we know what the impedance is in either rectangular form, so we know what the both the reactants, uh, excuse me, the resistance and the reactants are, or we know it in polar form, so we know what the magnitude and the angle of the impedance is, then we can use Ohm's law in the RMS phasor domain. RMS phasor V is equal to RMS phasor I times Z, and use this relationship to manipulate our complex power relationship and enable us to determine the complex power for our impedance with significantly less information. Um, so, let's see what I mean. So S is, by definition, the RMS phasor voltage multiplied by the complex conjugate of the RMS phasor current. If we substitute this relationship in for V, we're going to have I Z times the complex conjugate of I um, and so when we multiply I times the complex conjugate of I, what that gives us is the magnitude of I, IRMS squared, multiplied by Z. Well, if we know the polar form of our impedance, Z angle theta Z, this simply becomes IRMS squared times the magnitude of our impedance with a phase angle of theta z. So that's our complex power relationship where we only need to know the impedance and the magnitude of the current flowing through it. In rectangular form where z is equal to r plus jx, this becomes I RMS squared R plus J I RMS squared times X, our reactants. So this is going to tell us the average power and the reactive power for a particular impedance, um, only knowing the magnitude of the current that flows through it. Uh, similarly, if instead of substituting in V is equal to I times Z, we substitute in I is equal to V over Z, we'll find V multiplied by the complex conjugate of V gives us V RMS squared, and we're going to divide this by Z conjugate, right? Um, because when we take the conjugate of V RMS phasor divided by Z, we have to conjugate both the numerator and the denominator. Um, and so this is going to give us, um, if we know the polar form of our impedance, 
VRMS squared divided by the magnitude of Z with a phase angle of theta Z. And if we know the rectangular form of our impedance, VRMS squared divided by the magnitude of Z squared multiplied by the resistance plus J VRMS squared divided by the magnitude of the impedance squared times our reactance in question. Um, so we can use these relationships to determine um, the complex power for simple, re uh, purely resistive, purely inductive, and purely capacitive loads. Um, so I'm going to erase these. So for a purely resistive load, Again, that is when R is greater than zero and X, the reactance, is equal to zero. Our complex power relationships simplify to IRMS squared times the resistance, which is exactly the same as VRMS squared divided by the resistance. So for a purely resistive load, the complex power looks exactly like the DC power relationships that we covered on um, the second day of class, whenever we covered Ohm's law. Um, and we can see pretty easily then, there's no imaginary part here whatsoever, so the complex power is purely real. So resistors absorb average power. For a purely inductive load, which means R is equal to zero and the reactance is greater than zero. complex power absorbed by an inductor is going to be J omega L times I RMS squared or J times V RMS squared divided by omega L. Um, so there's no real part of uh, our complex power. There's only reactive power and the reactive power is always going to be positive. So we can say that inductors absorb reactive power. Finally, for a purely capacitive load, where R is equal to zero and X is negative, our complex power relationships simplify to negative j over, or excuse me, multiplied by I RMS squared divided by omega c or negative j omega c times V RMS squared. Um, so for purely capacitive loads, again we see that there is no average power absorbed, which is what we would expect. 
Um, so we only have reactive power, and the reactive power is negative. So we can say that capacitors supply reactive power. All right, so this pretty much sums up all of our different complex power relationships. Um, I believe the next thing that we're going to do is work a few example problems um, that will hopefully help solidify all of these different quantities uh, in your mind. Thank you for watching.